Our next speaker is Ladislav Ton from Quality Engineering Team EAP. Please welcome Ladislav. Should this be better? Yes. Okay, so hello. Um, I'm Ladjaton. I'm a senior inquisitor at Red Hat, uh, working in the middleware quality engineering team. And today I wanted to talk about value types in Java. Uh, the subtitle is Why Reference Locality Matters. And it, as it turns out, I have more slides on the second topic than on the first one. Um, so things happen. Um, maybe it's not that bad because it will be more useful for you, probably. So, um, value types. Um, if you search the web uh, and go through the history, you'll find that in 1997, James Gosling wrote a document. Um, it's called something like um, The Evolution of Numerical Computing in Java. Uh, because apparently, even in 1997, where Java was fairly young, uh, some people started to be interested in scientific computing, numerical computing in Java. And one of the things he wrote there was that one of the barriers to doing the natural implementation of, for example, complex numbers as classes, is that class objects are less efficient than primitive types like double and int. Um, and the entire document goes through a lot of um, pains that scientific computing people were having with Java and proposes uh, some solutions. To this day, uh, as far as I know, no, none, none of the solutions happened. So uh, that is probably going to change with Valhalla, which is what I'm going to speak about uh, in a short while. Um, but first, class objects are less efficient than primitive types. Why? Why is that so? Um, we've got a couple of people. Uh, I expect that most of you uh, are familiar with Java. So why do you think that classes or objects are slower than primitives? Right. Um, actually, there's a... There, Yes, that's, a, that's a, a short version of, of the correct answer. Uh, uh, I'll go through the long version of that answer. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, so the question was, uh, the answer. <laughs> the answer was that value types can be allocated on stack. Well, objects have to be allocated on a heap, and that has a lot of consequences uh, that I'll try to show. So. Uh, first of all, if I say something slower, I should probably back it up with numbers. Uh, this is the naive implementation of complex number as a Java class, of course, like in constructor and whatever, but you get the idea. Um, and I implemented a short benchmark with a couple of uh, complex numbers or number representations. Um, first of all, uh, how many of you are familiar with JMH, or the Java Microbenchmark Harness? Okay, so, uh, okay, so a short crash course to JMH, which is probably going to be the most uh, relevant or practical thing that you will get today. Right. So let me open this one. Uh, So, uh, actually, let me open this one first. So, JMH is uh, first. First, um, if you go to the JMH homepage, uh, home you will uh, get to uh, Maven archetypes that set up a whole lot of infrastructure, that builds a, a fed jar with JMH and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and because I'm lazy, I'm, uh, I went to the, the absolute essentials. So what do you have to do to start working with JMH? You include the JMH core, uh, core library, which is an API that you use. 
and you include an annotation processor, which is a compile time thing that generates, that from the benchmarks you write, generates code uh, that uh, wraps your code with a bunch of things that needs to be set up. So why JMH? Why don't, why don't I write the benchmark by hand? Uh, it's because JMH does a whole lot of things for you. There's a whole lot of things, a whole lot of ways how we get how we can get a benchmark or micro benchmark, especially wrong. Uh, JMH is not, of course, a cure for HIV. Um, it gets you a lot of tools that you can use, but you have to use them correctly. So if you wanna, if you find uh, sometimes a, a reason to why write a, a micro benchmark, go through the JMH examples. It's probably the only documentation that JMH ever has. Um, they are quite good, well commented, definitely recommended. Um, so, how does a benchmark in JMH look like? It's a class. Um, here's a bunch of annotations uh, that uh, all have uh, a special purpose. Uh, so, uh, quickly run through them. State. Uh, and not say, on it, it's a class that contains the state of the benchmark. If the benchmark has some, needs some state, uh, it belongs to a class that is annotated with state. It's got a scope which can be thread or the entire benchmark. Doesn't really matter because I'm not writing a multi-threaded benchmark here. If you do, uh, go and understand what the state thing does. Second, warm up uh, runs five iterations, or each iteration takes one second of a warm-up. This is before the benchmark will be measured. Uh, and then there's measurement. Uh, again, five iterations. Each one of them will take two seconds. This is the measured code, uh, the, 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 the part when performance will be measured. Fork one means that there will be only one JVM running this code. Uh, benchmark mode average time means we will report an average time uh, of uh, the benchmarked operation and output time unit nanoseconds. Um, okay, so the benchmark is parameterized by size of an array, um, and you can do that by the param annotation. There's a setup method which prepares the state of the benchmark. Here generates a bunch of uh, a bunch of numbers. Actually, I should have started with this one. It's, it's the same, but will progress better. So the setup method will generate a bunch of complex numbers, and the benchmark method just goes through the entire list of those complex numbers, uh, creating a sum, total sum, which is uh, captured in the variables RE and IM. Uh, and why I do return RE plus IM? That's not, that, that's not a complex number. That's a way to tell the compiler, uh, to actually force the compiler not to uh, get rid of this method completely. If I did uh, JMH, when I, when I return a value from uh, the benchmark method, JMH makes sure that this value is not optimized out. If I didn't do that, uh, JVM could be so smart to uh, optimize this method down to nothing. So this is a simple way to make sure that both, both variables RE and IM are used in the benchmark so that the JVM doesn't optimize them out. Okay, and JMH is designed to be run as a command line tool. So in this case, I, I create a main method with uh, an options builder. This is something I didn't want to show just yet. So, and this very simple example just uh, says include this benchmark and go. Um, and if I run that, which I can, just to make sure that uh, you see something, it's building and it's running a benchmark. Uh, you see that these are, uh, let me, let me make it a bit bigger. Okay, so 
So this was the first iteration of the benchmark with a parameter of the size of 10. Here you can see that uh, it's running a second iteration of a benchmark with a size of 100. And let me kill that because it's no, of no interest right now. So, so I wrote a bunch of benchmarks. First of all, uh, I created a list of complex numbers, an array list. Everyone is familiar with that. Uh, second, instead, I use an array. And for something even better, I used an array of doubles where, the, where uh, you first get a real part and an imaginary part. So that if you have 10 complex numbers, this array has 20 elements. The first two elements represent the first complex number, etc. And all this sum, okay, any question? Oh, it definitely should. Wow, this Did sucks. You, you this one on your let me let me show you. Um, let me show you this class. I'm fairly sure I did make this right, the right one. Okay, thank you. So, this is very stupid, but thanks. Um, okay, so um, what I did uh, I was the, the um, okay. Thanks. So I ran this benchmark with 10 complex numbers, 100, 1,000, 10,000. It already shows that there's a huge difference, but it goes like this. 1,000, 100,000, a million, 10 millions. You see that the, that the array of complex and the array list of complex uh, behave, fairly, uh, uh, behave almost the same. There's a small uh, difference. But the array of doubles, it's, uh, that's a huge difference. Why? Um, so this is how the, uh, the data structures in memory look like. With the case of array list of complex, the, the complex number is a reference to a list. That list has a reference to an array. Each element of an array has a reference to an object. So uh, being Java what it is, uh, everything allocated on heap, uh, basically in a random way, at least after a few iterations of the GC. This means that you have to chase pointers all, uh, of, through all the of, through the entire memory. Um, with the complex array, it looks slightly better because there's one reference less. Uh, but with the array of doubles, it's way way better because it's all in a single array that's laid out consecutively in memory. So with C, I would have uh, did uh, I would have done a struct array of structs that uh, represent a complex number with a struct of two doubles. Um, so, what's the problem? What's the difference in performance? Uh, where where is it coming from? Uh, and I claim that one of the uh, one of the reasons is uh, locality of reference. And I'm going to explain what that is. Of course. There's an entire possibility that there's a flaw in my benchmarks because I'm no benchmark expert. So the benchmarks uh, are online, are on my GitHub, so feel free to, to kill them. Uh, it's entirely possible that they are bad, and that, that they show really bad stuff. But I'm pretty confident that they are not that bad. Um, so reference locality. Um, reference, reference locality, if you look up the Wikipedia page, you will read that there's temporal locality and spatial locality and other kinds of reference locality. It boils down to a simple principle. Um, if you access a memory location, it's fairly probable that you will, in near future, need either the same location or nearby locations. Um, and CPUs and computers, how they are currently uh, created, they expect that programs will, ex will exhibit locality of reference. If not, your performance goes 
down through the floor. So, um, what it boils down to directly, the principle of locality, is caching and prefetching. And there's a nice article explaining a lot of cache effects using C Sharp, which is fairly uh, similar to Java. So, uh, there's a nice way to show how uh, caches work. It's this simple benchmark, which creates an array of integer numbers, meaning each element of that array has four bytes. And I go with one element, two, four, eight, 16 elements, uh, up to something like 16 million elements, which means that the maximum size of the array is something like 256 megabytes. I'm fairly sure that this doesn't fit into my cache. So uh, what this benchmark does is it iterates, uh, it, it performs 64 million of actions, where each action is incrementing a number in that array. And I go like first, increment the first one, then the 16th one, then the 32 one, 32nd, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is like this thing is like to, to avoid modulo because it has a high cost and uh, would uh, shadow all the effects of my, my benchmark. So um, how does it look like? Uh, one would expect that it's always doing the same amount of actions all the benchmarks, no matter how big the array is, all the benchmarks does 64 million of increments of some elements of the array. So how, why does it, why the hell does it look this weird? It, there's one, two, three, four, five segments where the benchmarks behaves maybe unexpected. Um, so let's go through them. What does this thing mean? Um, I mean, surely uh, it looks like that the, the bigger the, the array is, the slower the benchmark runs. So why the hell does this, where you have only 4, 8, 16, 32 bytes and 64 bytes, why is this slower than this one? Um, the size of the array. It's like if you divide this by 4, you get the number of elements in the array. So it's the size of the array in memory. OK? OK. So um, and, and this one doesn't really belong to this talk. So I'm not going to go, go deep into that. But is there someone who knows why is this slower than this one? OK. Um, I have, as a speaker, I have these coffee uh, <laughs> uh, things that I will give you for free if you explain why is this slower than this one. And, and there's a, this, this nice scarf you can get. So this is a good opportunity for you uh, if you can explain what, what the hell this means. The code. All right. Um, as I said, it's not, a, a not, not uh, the subject of this talk. So let me explain very quickly that this part, the, the first one, uh, doesn't really do what the benchmark is supposed to do. Oh, it is. Uh, it, it, yes. Uh, uh, so the array is so small that all iterations of the loop will write to the same element of the array, which means that there will be a data dependency between all the iterations of the loop. So the first, loop, the first iteration of the loop writes to a memory, uh, and modern CPUs are good with store, uh, storing that, that uh, memory write into a store buffer and going on. And did, it didn't reach memory yet. So the second iteration has to wait for the first, first iteration write 
to finish. Um, so this is the reason why it's slower than the other ones. Okay, uh, this is where it starts to get uh, relevant to this talk. So why is this fast and this slower? Uh, you look at the numbers at the, uh, at the, at the x axis, you will find that it's from like 64 or, or, or 128 bytes to something like 32 kilobytes. Clearly, this is, oh, fuck. <laughs> so, so this clearly fits into my L1 cache. This fits into my L2 cache, which is clearly like something like two or four megabytes. This fits into my thir third level cache, and this goes to main memory. Um, there's a nice program called LS Topo that will print uh, your, your topology of the caches. So here it shows that my L1 is indeed 32 kilobytes, L2 is 256 kilobytes, L3 is four megabytes. And then it goes directly to main memory. So I went uh, to a next level, and instead of the first, instead of this, where I went through the array in a predictable fashion, in this benchmark, I, went, I go through the array uh, in a completely random fashion. And it looks like this. Um, this is, of course, the difference of a prefetcher. The first one was completely prefetched. Uh, so here, even if I went from 8 megabytes to 256 megabytes, it was prefetched, and uh, the prefetcher was still uh, ahead of me. So it still looks nice. Here, in a random way, it goes down. It goes really bad once I get out of the cache. Uh, here's a nice uh, program called Perf. There was a talk on Perf um, yesterday. I didn't, didn't see it, but expect that it's something like this. So I did a benchmark when when I edit a perf profiler because JMH allows that. Let me just very quickly show that that uh, what I'm doing here is add profiler Linux perf norm, which means that uh, and and I'm interested in in L1D cache misses or and cache misses. Uh, what what the these graphs shows is a cache misses in the L1 cache, are normalized to a single benchmark operations. So there's a number of cache misses in the array of doubles case. Here's a number of L1 cache misses in the array and array list. And again, it goes really bad uh, very quickly with the array of complex and array list of complex. And there's another problem. Uh, this is uh, Java object layout showing the layout of the complex class, which means there shows that there are two double variables, both taking 16 bytes, and there's an object header which takes another 16 bytes. So there, it's like the half of the object is useful, and half of the object is useless for our purposes. With the uh, array of doubles, there's an overhead of 16 bytes, again, an object header, for the entire array. So with array of doubles, I have half of the size of the respective uh, complex array list or array of complex objects. So this is the solution that uh, James Gosling proposed in 1998. We've got Project Valhalla that might materialize in Java like 10 or 11, no one really knows. And uh, first of all, before I get to Valhalla, Java 8 introduced value-based classes, which are uh, final and immutable and generally, generally like value, which I'm not going into that. Uh, which, uh, the, the important thing that you have to ignore identity. So you can't compare them by reference. You can't take an identity hash. You can't synchronize on them. Or actually, you can't. You can, but you shouldn't. And there's a possibility that these classes like Java Util Optional or Local Data and others, will be converted to value types sometime later. So uh, there are two JEPs, or Java Enhancement Proposals in Java. The value objects for 
adding efficient by-value computation with non-primitive types, and another generic over primitives that will uh, provide a spe specialization of generic classes to work over primitive types, including value types. Uh, this is how you get, uh, how you build OpenJDK 8. Uh, this is one, this is a really interesting one. This is how you build Valhalla, uh, the prototype. So, um, and uh, the prototype by no means has a final syntax, so don't comment on that. So, uh, the, uh, the idea of value types is, uh, it codes like a class, but it works like an int. And there's a nice article, or actually a summarization of the efforts by John Rose on this URL. And currently, it looks like this. You create a modifier that the class will be by value. It has to be final, has to have final variables. Uh, all the fields have to be final. And instead of new, you call make, make complex. And this is a value, uh, value type. So it's supposed to reside on stack and will not have the ob object header overhead and all that. Um, uh, then we have generic spe specialization, uh, which looks something like this. Um, uh, it means that generics will stay the same as they are, but for, for, for objects, for references. And there will be added some kind of, and, and then when you try to instantiate the generic type for a primitive type, you will get a specialization. Uh, JVM will, at runtime, dynamically create another class specialized for that primitive type. So if I create a box of int, it will dynamically create a class specialized for, for, for the int. I have a nice demo for that, but sorry, out of time, I fixed, I took a lot of time explaining the, the interesting bits. Uh, you also have a list of int, finally. So this prototype, what it gives you, it gives you lists and array lists and other collections of primitive types and in the future also of the value types. Um, here's a reminder that performance of the prototypes is going to be pathologically awful for quite a while and this is a couple of days old. So sorry, didn't benchmark that. Um, this is I'm gonna skip and here's a couple of uh, links uh, the first one is uh, Brian Gutz speaking about value types on the last JVM Languages Summit. So, um, sorry for taking too much time in the first part. Uh, I wanted to do a bit more uh, demos of the later part, but uh, didn't happen. Sorry, uh, took a bit, uh, ran way too fast, uh, faster than I expected. So. <laughs> things happen. Uh, before you have any questions, and I'm sure there are many, please be sure to visit this URL and say that this talk was absolutely awesome. This is mandatory. I'm going to find you. <laughs> uh, and in case you have any questions that uh, you find later, uh, please email me on this address. So, questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not a Java programmer, mm -hmm. but I actually have a Can you hear me? Okay, I Perfect. hear you fine. So, I was setting the background. I'm not a Java programmer. Mm -hmm. I code in C++ usually. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, why was there a warm-up in the benchmarking? For the JVM to optimize the stuff. So, okay. um, that's one of the problems that of, of J JVM benchmarking that JMH solves for you. You have to give the JVM some time to optimize the stuff. Uh, if you were opti uh, benchmarking the unoptimized stuff, you would have benchmark, uh, benchmarked code that wouldn't run in production. Because you expect typically that uh, Java applications will run for a longer time, mm -hmm. will be able to optimize stuff for you and optimize heavily. So that's why the warm up. So does it make sense to have a warm up that is exactly long as the runtime? Um, or shouldn't it be? usually a lot less something. Um, so, oh, I didn't show that, but... Uh, but it was like five I, iterations. Right, right. Five iterations. Uh, but if you looked at the numbers, which were, were scrolling there really quickly, but if you looked at them, it showed uh, that five iterations of warm-up uh, was enough to stabilize. 
And I think I had the warm-up iterations one second long, and the benchmark iterations two seconds long. So they wasn't exactly the same. But if you look at the JMH examples, they use exactly the same time for the warm-up and for the measurement. So okay. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. The microphone. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so my question is about uh, converting the value types into object references uh -huh. because um, originally I thought the implementation would be similar to .NET where, uh, where there is a boxing and unboxing. Do we have similar thing in Java or is it really going to be a separate instance for every value type or a separate class for for the genera generified. Right. So I think that uh, the Java model that they are working on is quite similar uh, to C Sharp, where I think they are also doing specialization. But uh, to be honest, I'm not, not a .NET programmer, so I'm not really sure. But um, uh, the idea is that for each value type, there will be a specialized class. And when used in a place that requires conversion, conversion will be done. Uh, as far as I know, they do plan on automatically boxing and unboxing value types to reference types. Um, not sure if it will be in the final, but currently it's like that. Thanks for question. Uh, um, yeah. I was just wondering, doesn't this break uh, bytecode backwards compat compatibility? Um, they are actually planning to change bytecodes for this. So uh, it doesn't break bytecode compatibility, and they are going uh, through a lot of hoops to keep bytecodes still compatible. Uh, so for example, um, I'm not going to show that. Um, if there's, there's the um, box class, uh, this will be compiled to a class file um, as, as, as if it would be normally, like today. And there will also be another class file that will actually be an interface. And all the box uh, instantiations, either the reference ones or the value ones, will implement that interface. So that there will still be uh, all, all, bo all boxes, either reference or value types, will sh still share a single um, super, super type. But uh, the reference ones, uh, that in the way that it works today, will uh, keep working like they did. So, does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other question? Uh, I think we are exactly out of time. No, we still have eight minutes. Wow, two minutes. So you can I finish can your... One, one tiny example, um, which is... Um, let me value types Valhalla. What I have here is uh, this list class. It looks like exactly, uh, it's probably a bit too big, so let okay, it's still sh It will work badly, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm not sure why it's, 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 it will be moved to my other display. So anyway, uh, I have a list of int, as in primitive ints, and a list of integers. And I'm, I have a code that prints the class hierarchy of these, of these classes. So let me just run lists. I have a run script that compiles using the Valhalla Java C and runs using the Valhalla Java uh, VM. And actually, there's a special uh, option that the Java C compiler will compile values as, as references. Because currently, the Java C compiler is able to emit new bytecode for values, but the JVM isn't able to consume it. So this uh, option makes sure that it still generates uh, compatible bytecode, even if it will be actually references. So. Um, at the first, at the beginning, you see that it's specializing classes 
For example, I de declare a list of primitive integers. It will create a class list of uh, this name mangling, where, which means that the zeroth parameter, actually the first one, will be int. And it will specialize quite a lot of uh, other classes. And here's the list of int. And here's uh, a list of superclasses. And for each superclass, a list of interfaces it implements. So there's an array list of primitive ints, which implements a list, as it should implement. But that list will also be specialized for int. And that list will implement collection, specialized for int, and iterable, and blah, blah, blah. And at the same time, it also uh, it implements a list of int, and it implements also a list of any which is how uh, all lists, either list of primitive ints or list of object integers, still have the same uh, supertype, which is the array list of any. Then you have abstract list, and it goes like this forever. Um, so this is, uh, uh, should warn, this is a prototype. It might become, uh, it might end up somewhere really differently. Um, it won't be a super class, but it will be a super type. Yes. Oh, sorry. So does this mean that any is the super type of all objects and all value types, including primitives? And the answer is yes. It will be a super type. It's not a class, but it is a super, super type. Uh, and if you uh, uh, imagine a list of question mark, uh, which is fairly typical, this actually means list of question mark extends object. So list of question mark will still be list of objects. And then there will be list any, which is a super type of all that, super type of lists of objects, and at the same time, a super type of list of values and primitives. So this is this is kind of this shows uh, what they have to do to achieve compatibility, like what uh, .NET guys did. I think that they broke compatibility f with generics. Uh, Java guys uh, they tried to keep compatibility really hard, so they go to ha they have to go through things like this. So, does, so what will happen if I will have the list of any and I will try to do a code completion? So how can I what will be the actual type? Uh-huh. Uh, let me show. Yeah. Uh, if I do a code completion of list of any, how the IDE knows uh, what, what kind of types there can be. The, well, there can, uh, they will handle it the same way they handle it today, except that they, they will have to, in addition to objects, of which there are many, uh, they will have to include value types as well. Uh, there's actually an interesting problem with this. Uh, for example, uh, the class li list, uh, the interface list, uh, prescribes an, uh, uh, an overloaded method remove, which takes an integer, an index, or the value of that, of that type to remove. Uh, this is actually, pro this is of course problematic when you have a list of primitive integers. Which overload should you choose? And this is where these things come from, come to, uh, come to rescue. So the class, the interface will be changed to include those both remove overloads for reference types, and it will not include them for primitives or for value types. Uh, currently, the prototype uses a syntax like this. Um, uh, I'm sure there will be different syntax, or maybe they won't use this approach at all, but currently they are doing this. Um, did I answer the question? What will happen if I will type any dot? Um, there's nothing like any dot. Uh, what happens if I type in my AD any dot uh, and invoke... Com com so any is not a real type then? No, uh, so it's not a real type. No, it's not a real type. Um, uh, Right. Uh, did I answer the question? Somewhat. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you okay, for the presentation. Thanks, Dan.
and please go there and they say that it was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, should be like instead of a glass okay, it's like, uh, so uh, there there are some com compatibilities with the frameworks which expect like uh, so right I think just as a comment I think Okay, I'm, I'm not picking up my name. Just see Mati. Oh, yeah. 